when you end up in a situation where you have a bear coming at you you really need to stand your ground. The fact that we can stand on two legs makes us somewhat intimidating to a bear because other animals that they encounter don't do that. So being able to stand up, make yourself look big, loud, noisy, all the rest of that stuff can intimidate a bear. But if you get into a situation where you think as a, a bear is about to make contact with you or a bear does actually knock you down, then the advice that we give, if it's a grizzly bear, is to play dead. And whether you roll up in a ball or you lay flat on your belly on the ground, um, I've heard lots of different advice to the sort of position you should be in and there's pros and cons to each of those. So I, what I tell people is if I ever had to get in, if I ever had to get down on the ground and play dead with a bear, I don't think I would be really considering on my way down what my position was going to be, I would probably just get there and end up in whatever I end up in. But if you play dead with a grizzly bear, the majority of times they might investigate you, they might sniff, they might paw, they might actually even take a few tentative bites. But most often with a grizzly bear, once they realize that you have been subdued, they'll back off and they'll leave you alone. If a grizzly bear persists and either starts pawing intently or, or really seriously biting on you, then you should fight back. Uh, because at that point it has gone into a predatory mode and you need to fight it off, at least to the best of your ability. But, but yeah, playing dead seems to do the trick for most grizzly bears because unless they've already decided that their intent is to eat you, which most of the time it's not, their intent is really to subdue you. And once they've accomplished that, then they'll back off. And of course, you know, like anything with bears um, or any other wild animals, you know, it's a, a, I wouldn't say that that is true 100% of the time, but the odds are from, you know, all of the experiences that people have had with bears over the years that that's what you could reasonably predict would happen. I think pepper spray is one of the greatest inventions, honestly. And it has been shown the stuff is very effective. There was a paper that was published back in 2006 that looked at the efficacy of pepper spray on grizzly bears, black bears, and polar bears um, for all of the cases where it had been reported used on any of those species. And it's really impressive. Uh, about oh, somewhere around 96, 98% of the time it's effective in deterring an aggressive en encounter with a bear. Uh, most especially effective with, with grizzly bears. Probably the, the data looks that way because there are a lot more um, a lot more instances of it being used on grizzly bears. But uh, I think it's a really great tool. I encourage people to use it. And um, I, the one thing, well, there's a couple things that I, I tell people about using pepper spray all the time. One is the fact that it is not a substitute for common sense. Just because you're carrying pepper spray doesn't mean that you can do stupid things when you're living, working, or recreating in bear country. And also that it is a deterrent, not a repellent. So if you spray it on things, it doesn't work like bug dope. It doesn't keep bears away if you spray it on things. It actually has just the opposite effect. It's an attractant if you spray it on the ground or your pack or your tent or whatever. But if you spray it on a bear and get it into their face, it has to get into their mucous membranes in order to be really effective. So it needs to get in their eyes, up their nose, in their mouth. And if you do that, if you're successful at doing that, it, it's really very effective. So I think it's a great tool. Way better in my mind than any firearm. Um, I think about having to shoot a bear to make it stop uh, with a firearm as compared to shooting a bear with pepper spray to deter it and I would bank on pepper spray honestly because um, once they get a face full of that stuff chances are really high they're going to back off and uh, and honestly if a bear is heading straight for you it doesn't make much of a target also the fact that it's moving um, 
you know you've got that one little projectile to put into it whereas with a can of pepper spray you've got stuff that comes out the end of a can in a in a big cone and um, probably the hardest thing about pepper spray is that it has to be sprayed at a pretty close range somewhere between 15 and probably not more than 30 feet and um, and that's not much of a distance and it's really hard to hold off when you're being faced by a grizzly bear to wait for it to get close enough to make the pepper spray effective but it really is it's good stuff by far the majority of grizzly bears anyway hibernate up in the mountains most of them above about 3,000 feet usually between about three and five thousand feet generally they dig a hole into a dirt hillside for denning. Sometimes they'll use a natural cave, but there aren't that many of those around here. Where they do find natural caves, they'll use them over and over again. But where they're digging holes into the dirt hillsides, they'll usually only use a den once and then they'll dig another one the next year. In terms of denning together, the only bears that den together are sows and cubs. And so for a couple of years, a sow will be in a hole in the ground big enough to accommodate her and whatever size cub she happens to have at the time. If she doesn't have any cubs accompanying her that, that fall, then she'll then by herself. And the other thing that's really neat is that, and it kind of relates a little bit back to, to home ranges, what typically happens with cubs when they become independent from their mom, females, female cubs will usually carve out a little bit of their mom's home range as well as some other portion of ground that they'll make their home range and they will usually den at least for the first couple of years very close to where they denned with their mom whereas males will typically travel quite a distance before they determine a home range and they don't necessarily come back to where mom was denning or where they denned with mom to den that year. So the females tend to stick close to home. During the summer months here when we have darn near 24 hours of daylight, they probably nap during the day, a um, couple hours at a time. When we have dark hours during the night, they probably sleep a little bit longer, um, sleeping mostly during those dark hours. The one really neat thing about bears is that even in the dark, they do a pretty darn good job of being able to navigate through their habitat because of their keen sense of smell. And so um, a f one of the things that I always tell folks about camping, uh, we advise people all the time not to camp on a trail. And the reason being is that even if it's dark, um, you know, you think of a trail as being something that they would um, be able to follow using a tactile sense, being able to feel it under their paws. But actually they can follow a trail in the dark because they can use their sense of smell. Aside from the information that our backcountry users get through our backcountry operation, I and my staff do a lot of training for our own staff. We have crews going into the field all the time. And I have a long laundry list of things to do and not to do when you're hiking, when you're setting up camp, those sorts of things. And one of the things that I always tell people, and sometimes you can't avoid this, but you should try to avoid trails. It's the whole idea of the path of least resistance. You know, if it's easy for us to walk on, it's easy for any animal to walk on. And why wouldn't they do that? And so if you set up your, your camp right in the middle of some trail or something, some place that a trail leads into, like a clearing, mm -hmm. Chances are that at some point, some animal, a bear or, or otherwise, is going to walk that trail and either walk right through your camp or, you know, end up causing you a problem. So stay away from trails, or if you can't stay away from trails, it's actually really easy to deter an animal from walking on a trail by putting something on it. And it doesn't take much. Um, a, a, you know, a down a branch or something set in the middle of a trail will make an animal go around it. Rather than going over it, they usually go around it. And so it's real easy to deter animals, to divert them or detour them in, from places you don't want them to go by doing that kind of stuff. Of course, we never you know, recommend, like, don't 
you know, chop down a tree to lay it in the middle of the trail. But it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't take much. A downed branch sometimes will do it. So, um, but we do have plenty of um, examples in our list of uh, bear human interactions of uh, people actually being stepped on by bears or uh, tents being walked on or investigated because people have put those things or their bodies um, right on trails. So, yeah. Okay. Stay off the trails. <laughs>It's one of the reasons I always tell people don't ever think that you can determine whether you're looking at a black bear or a grizzly bear by color. We also have lots of cinnamon colored black bears here. Hmm. So just because it's brown doesn't mean it's a grizzly bear and just because it's black doesn't mean it's a black bear. We've got bears here that um, coloration wise, there's quite a range. Um, some of them are so light that they almost look white if you see them out on a bright sunny day. Some of them so dark they almost look black and um, especially when they're wet the darker ones look even darker and everything in between and we've also got some black bears that are sort of cinnamon colored so you can't necessarily be sure that you're looking at a black bear just because it's black or you're looking at a grizzly bear just because it's brown. You really have to look at some other characteristics. And, but what usually happens is um, females with um, spring cubs especially usually because once mom starts to run when we're chasing with the helicopter the cubs can't keep up and what will usually happen is that those cubs will I, I, I really think that there's some communication that goes on but I, I would sure love to be able to figure out what it is but it seems as though um, she gives them some kind of a signal to hide and they, you know, depending on where she is, if she's, you know, on a place where there's a rocky slope, you know, they might kind of get tucked under a rock or up against a rock, or they might be um, under a bush if it's a, you know, a vegetated area or something. But they'll usually find some place that apparently seems safe or for some reason they choose. And, and they'll usually stick there um, while mom you know while we're pursuing her after we get her down and probably for some time after we leave we always leave females laying well, well every bear we actually leave we call it sternal recumbent it's basically laying on their belly and we especially make sure that that happens with females with young cubs because we don't want the cubs coming in and nursing on her while she's sleeping they probably end up coming in sometime after we leave and all of the the uh, the ruckus has died down but generally they stay away while we're working on her. Sometimes older cubs um, get to be a little more brazen and they'll try to approach mom while we're working, especially after the helicopter is shut down. You know, really the only noise that's they're, they're hearing is, is the noise of us talking to one another and moving around. So um, that sometimes doesn't really deter the older cubs very much. Um, usually what happens though, if they start to try to approach mom and you know, we just stand up and yell and clap our hands. I mean, I've, I've never had anything happen other than them turn around and run off or at least run off far enough that it was a distance I was comfortable with. A lot of times they'll sit out there and they'll bawl for mom. They just cry. And, um, and that's, that's tough. Um, because obviously she can't give them any sign that she's okay, and um, and they just cry for her the whole time, and uh, and sometimes they'll sort of circle around us. Sometimes they'll just sort of move back and, and sit and wait. Um, you know, it really it really depends. We had a, a female uh, in May with um, I think she had three yearlings, um, one year old cubs, and um, and they got separated from her during the chase, but then they backtracked on her following her trail and we were sort of at the top of a hill and they were down at the bottom of this vegetated slope and I don't think 
they really realized we were up there and they just came marching up her trail thinking that they were headed straight for mom and they kind of came up over the edge and there we were um, fortunately we had a our fixed wing stayed with us because we knew the cubs were nearby and um, and they kind of gave us a running commentary on where the cubs were and by the time they came up over the crest where they could see us um, we knew they were coming and you know we just we yelled and waved our arms at them and, and they turned around and ran back down so we, we typically don't have any issues with cubs um, you know three-year-old cubs I get a little concerned about because they're usually about as big as mom but um, but they they seem to be generally they're pretty easily deterred gestation is um, actually deserves a little bit more of an explanation uh, bears experience something called delayed implantation so they breed in the spring generally they start breeding around May and breed through most of May and most of June by about the first of July the majority of them are done breeding and what happens is that a female her egg will be fertilized or most times multiple eggs will be fertilized those eggs divide to a certain point it's called a blastocyst and that fertilized egg that's gone through a couple of divisions will not implant in the uterus and start to develop until she goes into the den in the fall so it doesn't actually implant and start developing until about November so I guess you would consider gestation beginning then in November the cubs are typically birthed around February January late January February somewhere thereabouts and they come out of the den the cubs come out of the den with their mom in the spring um, first year well cubs of the year come out of uh, the den with mom usually late May sometimes even as late as the first part of June and they'll spend that whole summer with her and nurse that whole summer she's definitely lactating that whole summer after that first summer the cubs will be with her subsequently three more years it's hard to tell later on in the latter years if they're actually if she's actually still lactating I, I suspect probably not but the the cubs actually do still suckle a little bit uh, we've seen evidence of that females with three-year-old cubs and they they it's obvious that they've been suckling but I don't think they're getting much nutrition by that point in time.